Ashraf, thank you so much for joining us to discuss quality improvement in neonatal hemodynamics. Thanks, Danny. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be talking about QI and neonatal hemodynamics. I think it's something that um, is pretty um, new and up and coming in our field, and there's certainly a big, a big role for it in neonatal hemodynamics and, and in TE. So, just um, a kind of brief description for those who don't know, quality improvement is uh, the systematic or formal approach to the analysis of practice performance and efforts to improve processes or outcomes. And I put a little bit facetiously in the bottom there that it's not just CLAB C bundles, which is probably what we typically think when we think about quality improvement. There's a lot of different ways that we can um, integrate QI into the work that we do in neonatal hemodynamics. So we're really lucky in, um, in hemodynamics. I think we're, we're well poised, as you've heard from the previous talks, to be looking after multiple domains of academic work. Um, we would do work in knowledge generation, knowledge translation, and, and in quality improvement. And these three things can work um, together side by side and simultaneously. So I've given some examples here of that. Um, for example, we do a lot of knowledge generation in terms of conducting pharmacotherapy trials as it pertains like to PDA treatment. Um, from the knowledge that we generate from that, we're able to translate that into a consistent treatment approach, like a unit policy. Um, and from that, when we have some consensus across multiple centers or higher quality evidence from the primary trials, we're able to generate a higher quality clinical practice guideline and the implementation and evaluation of uh, clinical practice guidelines is part of quality improvement. We can see this along physiologic, physiologic studies. So in, in uh, hemodynamics, we do a lot of physio, um, echo-based phys, physiologic work. Um, so for example, assessing cardiac function in sepsis, there's a lot of knowledge generation there pretty recently over the last 10 years. From that, we can use TNE to basically decide how to uh, TNE can impact the role of sepsis management at the patient level, and then from that, develop standard practice guidelines or management algorithms that can be used to integrate TNE into the management of patients with sepsis or septic shock. And then finally, we also in hemodynamics look at a lot of, um, we perform a lot of epidemiological studies. So for example, looking at outcomes of kids with chronic lung disease and associated chronic pulmonary hypertension, we can translate that to follow-up of high-risk infants and then a quality improvement work. Um, extension of that would be the, the development of a multidisciplinary clinic. So these are a few examples of basically how kind of the three major arms of the work that we do can work simultaneously and can ultimately improve um, the quality of care that we provide for our, our patients. And specifically, um, what's the role of quality improvement in, TNE, in neonatal hemodynamics and why is it so important? Well, for one thing, we have a pretty resource intensive practice. So this is a little bit variable depending on how your, your, how the, um, your hemodynamics or TNE program is set up at your individual site. Um, but if you have a very frequently accessed consultative practice, for example, it can access, tap into a lot of resources to be able to run a TNE program. Um, and so you really want your management practices to be streamlined and efficient. And we heard some of that from Regan today about how labor intensive it is to develop and run the program. So you really want to make sure that your practices are, are as efficient as they can be. Uh, QI is important in terms of the clinical work that we do. So because um, so much of what we do has a really high, significant, uh, really significant clinical impact, for example, using ECHO to guide acute uh, care in critically ill infants, our care needs to be consistent, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be high quality. And then finally, in our roles as collaborators, as consultants, so many of us have TNE programs that are in consultant uh, that work in a consultative role in their, uh, in their hospitals. So we're, because we're working alongside the clinical team, um, our communication, the way that we're accessed and the way that we uh, communicate back our t &E reports and our recommendations needs to be, again, delivered safely, effectively, and in a timely manner. So there's a lot of reasons why quality improvement is, is a necessary component of hemodynamics. And when you break it down, I mean, uh, I'm going to describe a bit of, of uh, at Mount Sinai, we have a consult uh, consultative practice. So I've just drawn on the side there how a typical TNE consult would be conducted. It starts off from the clinical team for whatever XYZ clinical problem, whether it's uh, PDA or hypotension or pulmonary hypertension. Um, but then a TNE request is formulated. The echo is conducted by either a sonographer or a fellow. The echo is analyzed by the team. We come up with a discussion, sorry, a management plan, depending on what that hemodynamic issue is. And then we feed that back to the team. So the process requires a lot of different people 
playing a role from point A to point Z um, in order to get this echo ordered, done, and then fed back. So because there are so many moving parts, there's a lot of opportunities for moving parts to become an issue. So for example, the image acquisition, if you have multiple people involved in developing, um, in acquiring the images, stenographers, fellows, t &E staff attending physicians, then you need to make sure that you have a standardized protocol or some sort of minimum amount, minimum standardized way that these images are acquired in order to ensure that there's a quality, a minimum quality for the, the type of study that you're going to analyze. In addition, any unnecessary findings um, like valve stenosis, you need to have a standardized approach or a minimum number of things that need to be explored if an unexpected finding is found so that you're, you can ensure that the echo is done safely. Image interpretation, so a lot of studies that talk about inter and intra observer variability in terms of how measurements are conducted or qualitative assessments are performed. But again, these are things that need to be considered when you have multiple people involved in um, both acquiring and analyzing the image. The practice needs to be um, to have some degree of standardization. So obviously different TNE &E physicians will have different approaches, um, but there needs to be not significant variability in practices. Um, and usually if it's just one or two people, the practices are pretty well aligned. If there are process issues that come up frequently, um, these need to be addressed. So for example, you need to have a streamlined way of being able to access your TNE &E, um, service or the sonographer or the physician. If you are running a eight to five service or a nine to five service, there needs to be a way that that service is accessible, not just um, it, you know, random here or there where people having difficulties accessing your TNE. &E. Um, physician. So if that's the service that you've provided, there, there has to be a reliability related to it. And then finally, communication is a big part of this. So because you're a lot of what you're doing is kind of um, novel or might not be um, uh, well understood by all members of the clinical team. So for example, if you just put up the t &E report without the recommendation, without a clear assessment of your impression or recommendations, then it would be very difficult for the clinical team to interpret all the, all the quantitative values that you're reporting um, in your report. So there needs to be a clear means of communicating both answering the, the question or the t &E request, as well as communicating back any critical findings like unexplained or unanticipated uh, congenital heart disease, there needs to be a safe and clear way to communicate that back. So these are some just some um, different examples of where quality improvement can play a role in, uh, in basically conducting a hemodynamics, um, like a t &E scan or, or in the setup of your hemodynamics program. There are a lot of different steps along the way where things can work well and things can be improved. So these are some examples based on our local practices. If there are a lot of QI, formal quality improvement tools that can be used to assess um, the practice and to basically try to find ways to improve the practice if there is a deficiency or an improvement that wants to that you want to do. So if you have, um, there are a lot of ways to teach yourself about this. Um, and there are QI people at hospitals that may or may not have anything to do with hemodynamics that I would be happy to help with this. But these are just some examples of some tools that you may have, you may be aware of. They help you conduct root cause analyses, which most of this is basically brainstorming the reasons for why the problem exists and helping you to understand what could be the different factors that contribute to the problem. And the reason for that is because if you have it clearly laid out, you can, number one, pick low hanging fruit for things that can, you can easily fix in order to improve your problem without using a lot of resources or power or time. Um, and number two, you might not understand until you really put it all out there how different things can um, relate to each other and how different things can, can one problem can create another problem. So these are some tools that we use in quality improvement to help us really understand the root cause. When you've decided, when you've done that brainstorming, basically can approach after that, whether you wanna improve a process or you wanna improve outcomes. And these are two sort of high level ways to think in quality improvement about how I wanna improve whatever it is that I wanna improve. So for example, if you wanna improve a process as it pertains to hemodynamics, perhaps you wanna improve some component of actually, of the program itself. Um, like the, the way that t &E analysis is done across all of your t &E clinicians or the way your measurements are done are very inconsistent. So that leads to a lot of variability in interpretation or in management because the actual measurements are not done consistently. So this is something that could be done as a process improvement. Basically, you could do some education sessions, some teaching sessions. Um, you might have to do some modules in order to help um, all the clinicians basically be more or less on the same page. 
Um, it could be timely to do this and it may be difficult to conduct some of these types of reviews, but if you feel it's important to have standardization of how your measurements are done, which most of us would, then this is an important process. Conversely, you can look at outcomes and improvement of, of clinical, so this would be like patient outcomes. So for example, on a larger scale, you can actually use um, t &E to improve uh, clinical care for all of your patients in the NICU. So for example, you implementing a CPA, uh, a screening policy for high-risk infants for chronic pulmonary hypertension in order to standardize the timing of when the CPH screen is done. So it can be done early in order to improve outcomes rather than waiting until they're say 42 weeks corrected and making a later diagnosis. So I'm gonna give you some examples of um, some quality improvement work that has been done. And QI work is interesting because some things are not necessarily published as QI or, or, or uh, sold as QI, but if they're improving somehow the quality of care that's being provided to patients, then it's quality improvement work. Um, and there's just ways to implement formal QI methodology to these um, to basically tighten the process. Um, so for example, what, I, what you can see there is the um, TN Echo First Protocol from the University of Iowa. This is from the NHRC website. And this is an example of a way to standardize your echo, um, the first echo that's being done for any patient to ensure that certain specific views are always captured, certain clinical conditions are either are always assessed for or ruled out. And it's basically a minimum <clears throat> a number of images that must be done in order for this echo to be considered safe and interpretable. So this is, um, this is something that a lot of different uh, TNE programs will have. But what I've shown there is these are just two, two uh, papers that have shown that just having um, a, a common um, protocol for, for acquisition of images will improve uh, clinical outcomes um, or improve the, basically the reliability of the echo itself. This is another example of quality improvement work that helped improve clinical outcomes. So again, this is a paper, this is a local paper from Mount Sinai that um, assessed the impact of using a chronic pulmonary hypertension uh, standardized algorithm. So what I addressed previously, basically a standardized approach to screening and managing these um, high-risk children. So this wasn't uh, done with formal QI methodology, but it still is something that can be used to improve outcomes in high-risk kids. So it does still, um, it does still address that quality improvement field. And there's ways to do this with formal QI methodology if you had a local uh, person who was familiar with that. Um, a, a Canadian example is something called EPIC, which or Evidence-Based Practice for Improving Quality. So this is a national um, initiative that has multiple subgroups looking at improving the quality of care across multiple domains. The hemodynamics subgroup was formed in 2020 to basically address the high variability of practices um, across Canadian NICUs because of lots of different approaches to management styles. And so two things that came out of this group um, in the last couple of years, um, among others, were a more standardized approach to hypotension in both PPHN and in sepsis. So this is a bit more consensus based because a lack of high, there is a lack of high quality evidence specifically in this field, but even standardization of approach um, using physiological um, uh, rationale in the absence of high quality evidence can help improve care uh, delivered to patients. Whenever you implement some quality improvement project, measurement is a really important part of this. So you can, you can and should measure both the process and the outcomes. So you wanna measure the process to make sure that, for example, if you've implemented, if you've decided that your T&E turnaround time is too long, or you've decided that too many patients are getting missed for a screening echo if you've implemented a PDA screening protocol in your unit, you, in order to see if that changes outcomes, you have to first make sure that the, proto that the um, protocol is being implemented with high uh, buy-in and with high compliance. If your compliance is low, then for sure it's not going to change um, your outcomes. So this is on the right is an example of a run chart. You may have seen this before if you have any exposure to quality improvement work in the past, but it's one means of basically displaying data um, related to processes or related to implementation. And basically I would use this for example to say, um, oh, our median baseline you know, not percentage of missed patients was 3%. I'm gonna plot this on a monthly basis and assess the trend over time. And it's a really nice visual representation to show how my uh, process is changing over time to see if I'm making an impact or not. After that, we can look at outcomes. Um, so the question for that, for example, would be like, after I've done this for a year of our standardized protocol, and I've ensured that our compliance rate is sufficient, have I made an impact on 
you know, IVH rates in our unit. What I've showed you here is um, this is a study that just looked at um, surviving sepsis guidelines, which are clinical practice guidelines for sepsis management in adults. Um, and they've used for this particular study, they used quality improvement methodology um, to guide the implementation process, so improving processes. And then they use more standard or typical epidemiological approach to look at outcomes. And there's a lot of different ways to look at outcomes. So this is one example. And it's an example of how QI methodology can work hand in hand with traditional epidemiological studies uh, um, methodology um, to basically improve both your processes and your outcomes. So just a couple quick reminders. Um, a lot of times QI is mandatory, kind of higher level hospital mandated mandatory. So um, when, think, when embarking on anything just for because it's mandatory doesn't necessarily make it high quality. Um, and so there are a lot of factors that go into developing um, a high quality quality improvement project um, from both from starting way from the beginning from planning and getting stakeholders involved. Um, a really a major component of making sure your project comes out uh, successfully is it needs to be things need to be done consistently and they need to be done with data. It's really hard to tell where you're at if you roll out a project and then you assess the outcomes only two years later to see if you've made an impact with nothing in the middle. It's really hard to assess uh, truthfully assess what the um, impact of your project was. So it's that data, those measurements um, that drive your next steps. We call them PDSA cycles in, in, in the QI world, but basically they drive, how can I continue to make sure that this process is being implemented appropriately? And then along the same lines without follow up. So if you just implement a protocol without assessing it, it's a bit of a lost opportunity to see what the impact is of your protocol. You have an opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of effort that goes into developing protocols, algorithms, standardization processes, and they have opportunities to really improve care significantly for patients. So um, assessing, uh, assessing their impact is a really key way of, of not only local QI work, but expanding that outside of your immediate setting. So I encourage you to think about all components of the care that you provide as it pertains to hemodynamics and outside of it. Think about the big picture, which is more like your clinical impact, your outcomes, both immediate and then a little bit more short term and then longer term. And then think about the littler picture or the process of getting there, because all those things add up and play a role in your ultimate um, clinical outcomes. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Asha. That was fantastic.